This week is our time to strike. The armies of Davis are pinned and spread thin. For three years have we battled and bloodied our opponents, strangled them at sea. Look where we started, and look now. The West has been reclaimed from Arkansas, Louisiana, Missouri, Kentucky, Tennessee. Their parts are rendered useless, besides one at Mobile, and their armies still hold us at bay. But it now is the time for decisive strikes, for something big. In 850 BCE, the Assyrian army mined for the first time in recorded history. In June of 1863, a mine was employed against the walls of Vicksburg. It failed. Now, here in 1864, the hopes of the nation fall onto a mine once more. After a month of digging and a dispute, Burnside wanted a 12,000 pound charge, an expert from his time running an arms company, but Meade and others wanted the lesser 8,000, worried about Union soldiers being caught up in the explosion. 8,000 pounds are laid below enemy lines. The next question is, who is to lead the assault? It's a complicated question. Obviously, the crater left by the mine is not an ideal path to advance through. But to wheel around the rim is difficult even when not under fire. The decision is for the 9th Corps commander, Burnside's to make, and he picks the fresh 4th Division led by Virginal Edward Ferrero. We were all pleased with the compliments of being chose to lead the assault. Both officers and men were eager to show the white troops what the color division could do. It's a good choice. They're fresh, having previously done guard work and manual labor, well-trained, well-led, and a faith in their cause beyond measure. The two brigades are perfect, instructed in a complicated maneuver for each brigade to break to the left and right of the rim, the lead regiments following an especially different course of action. There's one more thing about Ferrer's men. They're African-American. As a division in politics get involved. President Lincoln on the 30th arrives to speak with General Grant. The meeting is filled with grand strategy and logistic minutia. The next day, Lincoln begins the trip back to D.C. Little is known about this meeting, and it's not the politics I was talking about. The only people who politic more than politicians are officers. Union High Command is concerned. First, should the plan go ahead? Grant and Meade believe it's their best option. Second, should the African American Division lead? Meade is reconsidering Burnside's choice. The relationship between Burnside and Meade is strained. Burnside outranks Meade. Now they are under a special situation where Meade leads, Burnside is happy with, and Meade less so. Next, Burnside requested more command to lead also those who are to support his corps. Meade believes Burnside is overstepping his authority and rejects it. And now the contention is over the lead division. On the 28th, Meade goes to Grant. If the assault is a failure, it will look like the color troops were sent to the slaughter as cannon fodder, such as the view of the 54th at Fort Wagner. General Meade said that if we put the color troops in front, it should prove a failure. It would then be said, and very properly, that we are shoving these people ahead to get killed because we did not care anything about them. But that could not be said. We put white troops in front. 1100 hours, the 29th. Burnside watches enemy line, eager to see it replaced with the crater. A staff officer informs him that two generals are here to see him. Major General Meade and Officer Edward O.C. Ord have come to tell him, far later than they should have, that Grant wants a change of lead division. Very well, General. I will carry out this plan to the best of my ability. Don't let this polite response fool you. Burnside is furious. To make such a big change at the last minute. And for what, some newspaper reporters? Who cares about reporters? Unwilling and unable to make a choice in good faith, he lets fate decide and has his three white division commanders pick lots. Virginal James Liddell draws the short straw and the worst possible one. Commander Robert Porter has proved a great subordinate to Burnside, from Second Bull Run to Knoxville to the Overland Campaign. Officer Orlando B. Wilcox is another superb leader, having fought since First Bull Run. Another man who grew with Burnside and will later be awarded a Medal of Honor. General Liddell is a drunkard! Having been inebriated during battle, his troops are strong and brave, but a wasted leader is a great detriment. And in every engagement, Waddell drinks. Burnside and Meade don't know this, but Grant does, and doesn't tell them till after the battle. July 30th, early morning, Meade advises Burnside to clear his front of obstructions, but Burnside refuses. It would alarm the enemy. The 5th and 18th Corps ready themselves to support the assault. The pioneers of the 9th grip their axes and shovels tightly praying for an easy time. Tick, tick, tick. Burnside arrives in his advanced headquarters. He sees a grand display of 22,000 men. 
9,000 are his, 8,000 from the 18th, and the remaining 5,000 from the 5th. Tick, tick, tick. 0315. Meet and staff arrive in Burnside's regular HQ. The old snapping turtle smiles. He sees a telegraph wire that runs to the 9th Corps commander. This technology of the future will help the present army achieve a victory for all time. Tick, tick, tick. Soldier of the 22nd South Carolina looks out. He is abnormally awake. The darkness doesn't reveal much. Tick, tick, tick. 0330 comes and goes. The clan called for the detonation at this specific time. What has happened? He has sent an earlier message to Burnside informing him he could delay the mine and the subsequent assault as the darkness of the day is stronger than expected. Burnside ignored this and refuses to communicate with his commander. Tick, tick, tick. Second slow down for the 9th Corps command. Burnside watches as the time turns to 0400. Burnside sends an aide, believing a confusion of orders has led to the delay. Tick, tick, tick. Grant arrives at Meade's side. He sends an officer to investigate Burnside, who has reported nothing. Burn to Ambrose, because there is nothing to report. Tick, tick, tick. Sergeant Reese, who oversaw the mining, and Lieutenant Jacob Dowdy are bravely crawling through the tunnels, hoping to find why the mine didn't explode. These men are in the dark, underground, marching towards 8,000 pounds of explosives. Maybe bravely wasn't enough. Tick, tick, tick. Grant watches as Meade grows more and more irate. Earlier, the commander had informed Burnside that if the mine didn't go off, he would alter the plans and continue the battle in another way. Now Meade sends a horrifying message. Soul will continue as planned regardless of his explosion. Tick, tick, tick. General Waddell is talking with an army surgeon. Not sick, but definitely need of the doctor's rub. Though Officer Ferrer is also procuring social lubricant. Tick, tick, tick. The lead brigades grow increasingly concerned about the delay. Tick, tick, tick. Grant and Meade look at each other ready to explode if the mine doesn't. Tick, tick, tick. Sergeant Reese and Lieutenant Dowdy arrive and realize the issue. The fuse went out. A quick fix. Tick, tick, tick. Birdside watches the result of High Command's wrath come in on the telegraph wire. Tick, tick, tick. Waddell begins to make his way to the safety of the bomb shelter. Tick, tick, tick. Colonel Elisha Marshall looks back to his comrade, Brigadier Bartlett. You're to lead the soul with their brigades. Bartlett is a brave man who has already lost a leg for this nation. Marshall hopes he doesn't lose any more limbs. Tick, 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 tick. Tick. Boom! The earthworks of the enemy are lifted into the air. The South Carolina soldiers are woken to see their last moments on Earth, before being buried under the dirt they rested on. The tidal wave of terror goes into the sky, and if the sun was there, it would have been covered like that of an eclipse. The little mass of federal infantry fear they will be buried alive. The regiments retreat, and ten minutes are spent reforming them. The forward brigade begins the battle. They become disorganized, ascending their battle works. The enemy obstacles are covered in debris, rendering the 130-yard dash an easy one. The only easy challenge for our men. When the weed Pennsylvanians arrive at the crater, the site seems biblical. 30 feet deep, 60 feet wide, and 170 feet long. As if an angel struck the land. Their opponents buried some with only their necks visible, others to their waist, feet protruding from the ground. 350 total. Their weapons disfigured. Two cans have been hurled forth. The shocking sight stopped some, struck dumb. The 1st Brigade in their rear, pushing them forward. Before the Brigade commanders could realize the situation, the two brigades became inextricably mixed in the desire to look into the hole. Colonel Marshall sees the confusion of his men. He needs to bring back order. Yelling to be heard, he demands the advance. Miraculously, his companies listen, jumping in, rushing past the remains of the dead and dying. General Bartlett follows Marshall's lead. Soon all of Liddell's division is in the hole. Where Rebel Salient once stood is the hope of the Union. When they reach the other side of the crater, tragedy strikes. To climb out is impossible. In an effort to prove their comrades wrong, some try to scale to the rim. As one is about to reach the heights, they fall back dead. The initial shock of the explosion stunned the Rebel response. Many officers were only awakened by it and rushed to contain the charge. The Salient has become inverted by the explosion. The Union soldiers become surrounded. It becomes a turkey shoot. South Carolinians grab their guns and take shots at the Federals, who aren't fighting back. One rebel, Major Gibbs, gathers men to man the heavy guns. At 1,000 feet, the single artillery piece does great damage to our men, separating men from their arms and souls from their bodies. Union artillerymen charge forth and with strength beyond human, sees two Confederate cannons hurting them on the rebels. Another brave man, Captain Spear, engages enemy artillerymen with his repeating rifle. Sergeant Strasburg leads a squad of other riflemen and single-handedly captures eight. The bravery of the men on the ground are wasted without command from on high. 
With no one to steer a better direction, those in the crater continued their desperate advance to the heights in front of them. Cemetery Hill. Fitting name. Rebel General Wei Mahone has successfully blunted the spirit assault of the 1st Division. Likewise, the 2nd Division that struck north of the crater has been sold, as has been the 3rd Division in the south. In a bomb-proof shelter, General Adele is drunk watching the horror unfold. He is joined by Ferrero, and they share their liquor. It's been a mere half hour since the detonation. Burnside has repeated orders to Adele, but now comes the time for the two low-functioning alcoholics to execute new orders. The General wishes you to move your troops forward to the crest of the hill and hold it. Liddell sends an aide forward to the crater to relay the message. Then for General Ferrero and his African-American division. Move his division through and charge down to the city. Ferrero responds cryptically. As soon as the troops are out of the way. Another order comes for Ferrero repeating the first, as does the third. Finally, Ferrero and Liddell leave the safety of their shelter to carry out the command. Joining them is Inspector General Colonel William W. Loring. He sees the situation and realizes it's hopeless. Ferrero waits for Loring to check with Burnside. Loring returns pale in the face. The order is not to be changed. Send forward the colored troops. 0730. The 4th Division begins their advance. A colored division map the works. They too go forward on the charge. We watch eagerly. This is our first fight, and we wonder if they will stand the shock. Noble fellows! Grant we they cost the field. They are under a withering fire, but still rush on regardless of fallen comrades. And gain the works with a ringing cheer! Colonel Joshua K. Siegfried watches as his brigade advances through the crater, pushing their way through the dead and dying. The 43rd U.S. Color Troops find a way to climb their way out and charge over the crest. Rebels are caught under the fury of our force. The 43rd capture Rebel Colors, recapture National Colors. Their victory is at a great cost. Colonel Bates of the 13th USCT is shot through the face, leading his regiment. The bravery of Bates earns him a posthumous Medal of Honor. The regiment started out segregated, but in the chaos of the crater they mix. Brave companies of the color troops hold onto the rim around the hole, but gunfire of the Confederates force them to fall into the slaughter pen. Duns Hill. General Lee gets a notification from General Beauregard. Old Robert reacts, sending two brigades from Anderson's division. Mahone takes command of them. As the line of Virginians begin to advance to the crest, Colonel Bross of the 29th rises up, waving the flag. Forward, my brave boys! Bang! The Confederate counterattack begins. Its first casualty is Bross. No quad! The Virginians are met by the 29th, but are quickly overrun. North Koreans follow up this, and the battle is brought back down to the hole. The mass of the Union Army are swept back, like a breath of air, or cut badly on the backward track. Regiments are rendered useless in the carnage. Bayonets cut through men, causing streams of blood. Musket butts bash out brains. The Georgian Brigade tries to follow up the success of their North neighbors. Luckily, the strength of arms of the supporting brigades destroy the Georgians. Brigade of General... Uh, however you pronounce that, with muskets and cannons repulse the rebels, though this expends the last of their ammunition. Burnside has seen the carnage and orders a withdraw. The supporting brigades are able to disentangle themselves. Those in the crater are unable to extract themselves. Mahone prepares his men, telling them that Lee would watch and no quarter should be given. The signal guns fire and the greys advance. It turns to massacre in the crater. For the colored troops are singled out and summarily executed. Why in hell don't you surrender? Why in hell don't you let us? Hold on there, they have surrendered. We lost 3,798 out of 20,000 men involved. Rebels 1,500 out of 11,466. A disaster caused by worry about African Americans being used as brought to the slaughter fulfilled its prophecy. As the captured colored troops are shot, stabbed, necks cut. Forms of brutality reminiscent of psychopathic murderers. General Bartlett and Colonel Marshall, who led their brigade at the crater, are captured. The Ninth Corps is blamed. Burnside is answerable for want of success. Ferrero and Liddell are charged for the drunkenness, which is a national embarrassment. But meeting Grant are more responsible for this disaster than the alcoholics. They're the reason why wives and children will receive a slip of paper instead of a returning soldier. God. Why? To the valley, the 30th sees Schomburg, Pennsylvania alight, for failing to provide an appropriate ransom to the rebels. The citizens see their homes burnt down. Joe McCausland, who coordinated the flames, goes down in infamy for the destruction he brought. The next day he's engaged by Federal Cavalry, where he suffers a loss. The real action in the valley is a command change. 
The failure to hold early at bay has angered and worried Grant. The first, he gives an order. I want Sheridan put in command of all troops in the field with instructions to put himself south of the enemy, fall him to the death. Wherever the enemy goes, let our troops go also. Once started up the valley, they ought to be followed until we get possession of the Virginia Central Railroad. Major General Sheridan is given the Army of the Shenandoah, composed of the 6th Corps, the Army of West Virginia, his own Cavalry Corps, and the 19th Corps. Only Gregg's division of horsemen are left behind at Petersburg. No expense is spared to bring the valley back into federal command. This doesn't satisfy Lincoln. More likely, he doesn't understand Sheridan. I have seen your dispatch and what you say. I want Sheridan put in command of all troops in the field, with instructions to put himself south of the enemy, fall him to the death. Wherever the enemy goes, let our troop go also. This, I think, is exactly right as to how our forces should move. But please look over the dispatches you may have received from here, even since you made that order, and discover, if you can, that there is any idea in the head of anyone here of putting our army south of the enemy, or following him to the death in any direction. I repeat to you, it will neither be done nor attempted unless you watch it every day and hour and force it. A. Lincoln. Your dispatch at 6 p.m. just received. We'll start in two hours from Washington. We'll spend a day with the Army under General Hunter. It seems Grant and Lincoln will have a second face-to-face -face meeting. Last week, Arkansas saw a rebel raid that beat a 200 cavalry contingent beyond the gates of Fort Smith. Overall, Confederate Commander Douglas Cooper, bolstered by that success, decides to bring battle to the fortified town itself, with General Stan Waddy's and General Richard Gano's brigade. He captured Van's pickets and brings his cannons to bear. He's outgunned. The superior rifle cannons of Union officer John Thayer force the batteries of Cooper to retire. The Federal guns bombard the rebel forces, winning the battle. The secessionists realize they can't storm the town. The Union has a firm hold on Arkansas. And anything short of a major influx of manpower and supplies, it will remain that way. That was a nice buffer. Let's march to Atlanta. The 30th sees a disaster. General Sherman had ordered a mounted raids from General Stoneman and McCook. Stoneman broke from plans, leaving McCook alone. Now, the following is probably sourced. I'm looking at you, historical marker that doesn't match his transcription. At Lovejoy Station, General Stoneman is captured becoming the highest-ranking federal officer captured by the rebels. I believe the highest-ranking rebel ever captured is Lieutenant General John C. Pemberton from Vicksburg. General McCook is also captured. Instead of freeing the prisoners of Andersonville, our brave men joined them. What a disgrace. Though both cavalry gone, Sherman instead directed an assault by his infantry. General John Schofield and his Army of the Ohio are moved from the east to the west to strike against the rebels at Utoy Creek. Created by the 14th Corps under Officer John Palmer, who is upset that he is under the command of Schofield. The action is delayed and rescheduled. And on the 5th, a single brigade takes a skirmish line. Next week, we'll see an actual battle. With Georgia concluded, you might think we are done, but no, there is a third field of major operations. But before we get to that, we have a political bloodbath. The way Davis Bill met its death by President Lincoln's hands. With the Republican Party already split, Senator Benjamin Wade and Representative Henry Davis write their response, a manifesto. We have read without surprise, but not without indignation, the proclamation of the President on the 8th of July, 1864. Supporters of the administration are responsible to the country for its conduct. It is their right and duty to check the encroachments of the executive on the authority of Congress, to require it to confine itself to its proper sphere. They go on to accuse Lincoln of perverting the Constitution and overreaching his power to control electoral college votes. The aftermath of this manifesto sees a backfire for Wade and Davis, with Davis now under threat of not being nominated for re-election. This leaves us with one final topic. In 1862, the rebellion lost its biggest city, New Orleans. Since then, the ports that fed the southern states have been closed one by one. In response, blockade runners risked their lives bringing in supplies for profit. And the final port that matters, Mobile Bay, the safe harbor for those runners, is under assault. The first admiral of the nation, David Farragut, leads the naval contingent. An old man, 63 years of age, but the best seaman of America since John Paul Jones. He leads the West Gulf Blockading Squadron. He's aided by Gordon Granger, who was removed by Grant, who once thought to fall in obscurity now has a chance for everlasting glory. The infantry arrived on August 3rd. Further ships steamed to Farragut. Mobile's day of succession are over. 
signal officers prepare themselves for the upcoming battle. Among 18 ships, they will have their work cut out for themselves. The harbor is defended by three gunboats, forts, and the CSS Tennessee, the greatest ironclad the Confederates have, under Admiral Franklin Buchanan, the highest-ranking naval officer of the rebellion, equivalent to the full general. This is the ultimate battle of the navies. The fifth, the iron hulls of Farragut align themselves in a brilliant formation, ready to pass the forts. The wooden ships form behind their armored sisters and tie themselves so as to keep as one. The army in the field dig in across Fort Gaines, ready to bring the earthen barriers to heel. Board the USS Hatford, the flagship. Admiral Farragut holds his binoculars to his eyes. Next to him, his second command, Captain Percival Drayton, shouts orders as the ships begin to move forward. Drayton is from South Carolina, with bluer blood than most, loved by his men, a naval genius in his own right. A calm counter to Farragut's ferocity. He led the council that told the admiral he could not be the lead man in the assault. Keeping the commander from suicidal bravado has been his main role. The early daylight reflects off the blue waves that are cut by the tip of the vessels. Boom! The cannon of the USS Tecumseh sounds to start a battle. The need to pass the forts ensure the ships never settle into an accurate range. Luck be praised, neither do the rebel heavy guns. Farragut's next worry is the field of torpedoes. And behind that, the final challenge, the enemy fleet. The Tecumseh continues to advance. Commander Craven leads the assault, a brave soul. When suddenly an explosion sounds, his vessel has struck a torpedo. Craven and the pilot rush to a ladder. As a gentleman, Craven says, You first, sir. He doesn't follow. Within half of a minute, the ship is underwater. The first and a gigantic setback. Unsurprisingly, this brings fear into those that see the travesty. David Farragut has no fear. In order to increase his observation, he climbs the rigging. He is 63. If he falls, he will die. Captain Drayton, not wishing to lose the greatest naval mind to loose fingers, orders an officer to bring the admiral down. The officer is told to piss off, but completing his duties, he ties with rope the aged Farragut to the mast. I must say that despite my immense respect for Farragut, this is hilarious. The Brooklyn slows down to confirm orders in fear of the torpedoes. Seeing this, Farragut has some words for his subordinates. The most famous words of the Navy. The most conflicting quote I've ever seen. Damn the torpedoes, full steam ahead. Like that, the Hartford takes the lead that the Admiral wanted. The torpedoes do no more damage, submerged for far too long. The time for the CSS Tennessee has arrived. Though it misses the Hartford, engages the other Federal forces. The other rebel gunboats sail to the sides and bring their fire to bear. The CSS Selma loses its upper commanders and is forced to surrender. The CSS Gaines is shot to pieces, beached and burned. The CSS Morgan is forced to fall back. Like that, the Tennessee is alone. Thick armor protects it from ordinary shot and shell. Casemate ram imposing. It sees itself rammed by Farragut's fleet. Though these attacks do more damage to our ships than the Tennessee. Run down the ram! By now, the Tennessee is motionless. Shots have struck the boiler system and chains. Its guns sound off with poor powder and multiple misfires. The Chickasaw and Manhattan blast away, killing Confederate crew and wounding others. The iron armor repels shots, but begins to bend. They would have fight back and unable to continue the battle. Admiral Franklin Buchanan, walking with a limp, wounded in the leg, surrenders. Soon follows Fort Powell. Granger strengthens his grip on Fort Gaines. Mobile Bay has returned rightfully to the Union! Then there is Sickles. He has his own naval adventure, sailing with friends all the way to the Carolinas. Though it's not a happy time, here's the plight of Union prisoners in Charleston, transferred from Andersonville. Some 500 are crimped into even worse conditions. This horror moves our man. He writes to Lincoln, wishing for a prisoner transfer, which has been banned. These men deserve an exemption. They need food and medical attention. It's a humanitarian cause. That's where the week ends, and it's split in two. Crater or Mobile Bay? and I choose Mobile, Alabama. I am always impressed by Farragut, an aggressive and abrasive admiral. He still always brings an elegant artistic flair to his plans. From the beginning, he has brought victory to the Union. New Orleans fell for him. He brought victory at Vicksburg. And now Mobile becomes another gem in his crown. The Battle of the Crater was a long slaughter. The action at Mobile Bay was far more important. But simple perfection is never truly appreciated. Well, it's the entire Civil War Week by Week team here. And I'd like to thank you for watching, and if you liked it, please like, yada, yada, yada. In the end, I am honored that any of you guys would spend your time listening to me. I do hope to see you 
next week.